On September 5, 1969, a ship called the SS Manhattan entered the Northwest Passage to cap a 500-year-old saga of exploration. Biggest merchant ship ever to fly the United States flag, she undertook one of the biggest challenges of the sea ever attempted. To sail across the top of the world and back, to open up the trade route dreamed of by seafarers since the days when wooden ships first looked for new continents. To be the first commercial vessel to conquer the Northwest Passage, celebrated in legend for centuries as the quick way to fame, fortune, and romance. The open water of Baffin Bay presented no obstacles, only some mild-looking icebergs, most of them far away, were reminders that the frozen north might not release its treasure too easily. Captain Roger Stewart was in command. He and the Manhattan were not alone. Among the support forces, the Canadian icebreaker Sir John A. Macdonald and two similar U.S. Coast Guard ships working in relays. Helicopters scouted ice conditions ahead. Altogether, it was a $40 million undertaking, a $40 million gamble, because despite meticulous advance planning, there was no assurance of success, since no such scientific foray into the ice had ever been tried. It did not take long for the Arctic to close in on the Manhattan, but the ship was ready a super tanker with ice-breaking capability built in. Larger, more powerful, more maneuverable than any similar vessel at sea. Earlier in the year, the ship had been rebuilt at the Sun Shipyard in Chester, Pennsylvania. She would gross 150,000 tons, her deck longer than three football fields put end to end. More than 15,000 people from all over the world were involved at one time or another in planning the Arctic attack. In addition to the men who built her, an international community of experts was gathered to design and test the idea of a tanker in ice. Data was gathered near Grenoble in France where an experiment was readied for the possibility that a whole fleet might someday sail in the path of the Manhattan. Model boats were prepared to determine the best bow shape for year-round tankers. Three basic configurations were studied. When the lake froze over, the Sogria Company, which had been retained by Exxon, went to work. Boats, one twentieth the size of real tankers, began their own unique battle with varying thicknesses of ice to see which kind of bow would work the best. One whose chief strength lay in ramming straight ahead, or another which crushed the ice by a downward braking action. Cameras recorded evidence for later analysis. The Manhattan herself took shape on paper at Exxon's drafting center in New York City. Among the considerations, would she be able to break through pressure ridges, reefs of frozen seawater up to 100 feet deep? The master design neared completion. When finished, it was passed on to the builders at Chester to be welded into reality. The Manhattan, launched seven years earlier, was made anew. A heavy steel ice belt was wrapped around her hull from bow to engine room. Ice guards were added underneath to protect the rudders. Throughout the ship, internal strengthening was built in to protect against crushing. She became a sea-going fortress. And to do it, she was literally sliced into four sections. No single shipyard facility in the United States could handle all the modifications. The bow and stern remained in Chester. The midship section was towed to Mobile, Alabama. The forward section went to Virginia. An entirely new bow was built at Bath, Maine. 
The revised bow would move the Manhattan onto the ice at an 18 degree angle, gradually increasing to a more conventional 30 degrees as the ship moved forward. The weight of the tanker, it was hoped, would force the ice down until it cracked. And crack it did, as the Manhattan barreled through at up to 16 knots, like an immense ramrod. By now, the ship was nearing the end of Melville Sound. A day ahead, the entrance to McClure Strait, and the toughest ice of all. The Manhattan would occasionally grind to a stop, and ice parties, men from Hanover and others from the University of Alaska, would scramble over the side. On pre-selected flows, they would fan out with their gear, augers, drills, saws, measuring equipment, and markers. The ice was bored to determine thickness. Four-inch core samples were gathered so the shipboard lab could analyze salinity. Salt content was highly important. New ice has a lot of it. Salt makes the ice unstable and easier to break. Older ice, lower in salt, is tougher to crack. At the same time, the area through which the tanker was moving was under continual two-pronged aerial surveillance. This Canadian Department of Transport DC-4 was often joined by a U.S. Coast Guard craft, which scouted with its special side-looking radar. Sweeping beyond the ship, both planes mapped and assessed ice conditions as they went. On September 10th, Captain Stewart took his tanker into the hidden Himalaya of ice, the dreaded McClure Strait, where over a hundred years ago, Robert McClure had been frozen in for a year and a half. Hammering every inch of the way, the Manhattan forced her passage into the Strait. For 120 miles, she punched through range after range of polar ridges, deliberately avoiding the easier open water passage to the south. Finally, with a field of thickly compressed old flows crushing in on all sides, the Manhattan ground to a frozen stop. She had met her match. The call went out to the McDonald, and the Canadian icebreaker moved to the rescue. The Manhattan, lacking sufficient reverse power, was unable to back up enough to ram her own way out. The McDonald's job was to chip away at the ice around her, so the Manhattan could get free enough to move. Again and again, the icebreaker poured on her 15,000 horsepower to break away the ice that pressed in against the giant tanker's sides. On the Manhattan, a tense period of waiting. At last, Captain Stewart called for the engines to generate all 43,000 horsepower for the first time during the entire trip. The idea was to rock free by charging full speed ahead, then full speed reverse, then full speed ahead again. The process repeated over and over. A slight movement, and the shuddering forward-backward action continued. Every non-essential utility aboard was shut down to feed all available power to the propellers. Like an automobile trying to extricate itself from a snowbank, the Manhattan hurled herself ahead, and then astern, again and again. More pronounced motion now, as the ice at both ends of the ship began to crumble, foot by foot, gradually creating the running room that would be necessary to ram ahead. And then, with a grinding forward lunge, the Manhattan slid up on the ice, demolished it, and broke out. She changed course, heading south, 
and without further incident steamed to a successful completion of her trip. The day, September 14, 1969. The Northwest Passage had been breached, 1,100 miles of ice. Never before in the history of ships had a commercial vessel done it. Ahead in the open sea, her destination, Point Barrow, Alaska. But the end was only the beginning. A large, powerful merchant ship could cross the passage, but the economics, the dollars and cents practicalities were unknown.